All right. Good afternoon, everyone. We're so thrilled to have you here once again. Uh, this is our November presentation of the Fairness First X Talk, and we're so thrilled to have um, Dr. Talima Pearson here, who is going to give our talk on finding golden grapes in the community, the foundation for controlling staph infections. So before we get into the presentation or the talk, um, I just quickly want to give you an introduction to get acquainted with the Fairness First X Talk series. Um, it is an event or a strategy that is supported through the Southwest Health Equity Research Collaborative at Northern Arizona University. And this particular strategy is oriented for both um, academic audiences and community audiences. And it's really modeled after the popular TEDx talk program, which I'm sure many of you have attended in the past. So it really gives um, a platform for our health equity funded researchers to present themselves as you know, human beings and for us to connect through this platform of understanding each other from uh, what has influenced uh, the researchers interest in their particular area of health equity research and why that matters to them. And then moreover, why we should all um, have some concern about, about the topic in some way or another. So um, it is really a place for connection, for community learning, and um, it is grounded in just fostering curiosity and really supporting that curiosity going forward. It's also a way for us to see what is health equity research because that can seem to be like an ambiguous term for most people. And so we just wanna share that it's multifaceted. Um, it, it, um, it is very interdisciplinary. And so we also wanna showcase that through the Fairness First X Talk series. So like I had mentioned before, this um, Fairness First X Talks is a strategy that is a part of the Fairness First campaign. And my assistant, Alexandra Olin, uh, will be presenting that link in the chat for you all. Um, it is sponsored through SHRC or the Southwest Health Equity Research Collaborative at NAU. And here's just a little picture to the left hand, in the left hand corner of all the folks who um, are a part of our SHRC community. And then um, the right hand side should show you where we are actually located on campus in that beautiful glass building there. So a couple of things I want to go over with you all is just to go over some community agreements as we go forward. Like I had said before, um, the TED or the Fairness First X Talks is really a place for us to come together as community and connect with each other on a human to human level. So we try to simulate in-person connections and we do that through asking you to um, keep your camera on if possible, and that will help us to strengthen our engagement with each other and as well as with our presenter when it comes to having that interactive Q&A session that um, will happen midway through the presentation. And then my second ask of you is to stay muted during the talk unless you're prompted to share. Um, that could be a question that our presenter might pose to you as the audience. And so that would be a time where you can unmute and share your thoughts or share your response. And then our last one um, really centers on staying engaged in the conversation and partic please participate during our Q&A because we do have this really awesome opportunity to have these in-person or person-to-person -person, um, conversations with our guests here. So in all, those are our three agreements. And at this point, I do want to transition over to um, Tal to introduce himself, and then we can get started with his talk. But again, thank you so much for being here. OK, thanks, Carmen Lita. Um, let me share my screen. And OK, does that look good? Everyone can see it? Good. OK, well, um, thanks for inviting me. And I'm really excited about giving this talk. I'll start by telling you a little bit about myself. 
Um, when I was born, my parents lived in Ghana in West Africa, um, but my parents were actually visiting my mom's parents who lived in the UK. So I was actually born in the UK, but um, my all of my brothers, both older and younger, were all born in Ghana in West Africa. So I grew up in Ghana. I spent eight years there and it because of the economic situation we had to leave in about 1980 and through a circuitous route we eventually found ourselves living in northeastern new mexico near a small town called las vegas las vegas new mexico is actually the original las vegas for most people um most people don't know that anyway um so we lived in New Mexico until I was 17. Then we moved back to Africa. And in this case, we moved to Southern Africa to a small kingdom called now called Iswatini. It was previously called Swaziland. So um, I still refer to it as Swaziland, even though the, the king has now changed its name to Iswatini. Um, here on the left is a picture of me and two of my siblings, my older brother and one of my younger brothers. Um, I'm in the the uh, lower right hand corner of that picture. Um, so this is uh, me growing up in in Ghana. And part of living in in West Africa is that there are very few white people. And so my brother and I were the only white kids in our school. Uh, West Africa is also known as the white man's grave because of all the diseases, um, especially malaria, which um, Africans are more resistant to because of, of uh, sickle cell disease, genetic mutations. Um, I've had malaria a couple of times, as have pretty much everybody that lives in, in Ghana. Um, I've also had all sorts of other um, viruses and bacterial diseases and um, and also parasites. So that's that's part of life. Um, but it's not only the microbes that that are out to get you in um, in West Africa. Um, but when I was five years old, I was almost eaten by a huge python. but um, the python ended up eating my dog instead of me. So, I guess I was kind of lucky about that. But um, other than that, Ghana was a great place to grow up. The people there are exceedingly friendly and, and known throughout Africa as the most friendly people um, in, in Africa. It was really safe and and uh, I really miss living in, in Ghana. Um, so throughout the first 20 years of my life, I lived as a minority in in uh, every place that I've lived um, up till the time I started college. And the populations that I lived in were all socioeconomically disadvantaged. And that's kind of shaped my interests and my career choices. When I was a little bit older and living in Southern Africa right before college, I was particularly interested in the natural world. I loved visiting the nature reserves and game parks and neighboring South Africa had phenomenal game parks. And, and But at the time, South Africa was under apartheid. Um, it was really interesting for me to see how the white minority in South Africa really benefited from ecotourism, but the black population was largely left behind. And so some of my early career dreams were to pursue conservation plans that benefited um, the poor regular people um, that lived in the community as a more sustainable model for conservation. And so um, with these ideas, I entered college and I went to college at a small um, at a small liberal arts college in Richmond, Indiana. And there I studied general biology. And um, and after graduating from college, I worked on a number of different um, conservation, mostly conservation um, 
research work, mostly studying endangered birds. So down here on the lower left-hand corner of the screen is a bird that I studied in Hawaii. Um, that bird is called the Pouli, and I was one of the last people to see this bird alive in its native habitat. Soon after I left Hawaii, um, they captured the what they thought were the last two remaining birds and brought them into a captive breeding facility. That unfortunately didn't work out, and so this bird is now extinct. Um, the bird that's in the middle is the bird that I studied for my master's thesis. And that bird is called the Southwestern Willow Flycatcher. It's a, an endangered subspecies of the Willow Flycatcher um, that lives in riparian areas in the Southwestern United States. We were um, monitoring their nests and nestlings and we were catching them and taking blood samples. And I noticed that sometimes we caught males in territories that weren't theirs. And so I was really curious to know more about the breeding and the mating behavior of these birds. So um, most birds tend to be monogamous, but promiscuous, right? So they only have a pair bond with a single other male or female, um, but they have, they solicit sex outside of that, that pair bond. Um, a handful of birds are polygynous, meaning that there's one male and multiple feet to multiple females. And that's because the male isn't tied down and caring for the eggs, um, incubating and feeding the nestlings. That's, that's a female's job in some of these birds. Um, and so, um, in mammals, for for instance, polygyny is very common because females, just because of their biology, shoulder most of the 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 care in uh, um, for being pregnant for so many so many months, and then for feeding infants, and so that releases the the males from uh, um, those sorts of of um, responsibilities, and then they can go out and solicit extra matings. Um, there are some birds that are interestingly um, polyandrous, meaning um, one female to multiple males. And the reason that that works is because the males are um, sort of biologically set to take on those um, some of those parenting burdens. The male birds in some of these species will actually be the ones that sit on the nests and incubate um, the eggs. So in those cases, the females are free to solicit extra um, uh, breeding and mating opportunities. So I was really interested in bird sex. Um, and so we were we were collecting blood samples. And so I was really interested in knowing um, and looking at the paternity for um, the, the birds and the, and the nestlings. And because for conservation efforts, it's really critical to know who's successfully breeding and who's not breeding. So that's what I did for, for my master's work. And that interest led me to NAU, where I worked with Dr. Paul Keim, who also did some work in conservation genetics and was interested in that. Um, but Paul also worked on DNA fingerprinting of anthrax and a lot of other um, bioterrorists or biological agents and, and uh, bacterial pathogens. So, and then in 2001, there were the famous anthrax letter attacks where um, Bruce Ivins, who was the main suspect, was suspected of sending these letters to, to Congress and, and to other people around the country. In the end, about um, 53 people were exposed, 22 people were infected with anthrax, and five people died of, of anthrax. And the FBI was, was really interested in finding out who sent these letters. And so this work really consumed Paul and his entire lab. And, um, and at the time, Paul was the world's expert in being able to differentiate one type of anthrax from another. But it became clear um, really soon that the type of anthrax that were used in this letter was spread all over the, um, all over the world. 
because it was a really good model organism. It was highly virulent and lots of people were doing experiments on it. So we needed a much higher resolution um, method to be able to tell the, um, the anthrax strain from one lab from the anthrax strain in another lab. So um, the FBI invested millions and millions of dollars into whole genome sequencing. So now we were sequencing the entire genomes instead of just looking at small portions of the genome in order to tell different, different strains of anthrax apart. Um, and so because of this investment with with the that the FBI and the federal government made, um, this spurred a the development and, and revolution of new sequencing technologies. And so um, at the beginning, um, and when I started doing my PhD, it costs about a million dollars to sequence a genome of anthrax. Um, and now, to sequence a bacterial genome, it just costs a couple of hundred bucks. So um, sometimes bad things happen that spur a revolution and uh, and make with good things that happen after that. Um, so I was dragged into this world of bacterial pathogens and genomics, and I found it fascinating. And and so I jumped on that bandwagon, and I never looked back. And so here's a sort of a word cloud of, of 17 pathogens that I've published on. And the frequency that I've published is indicative of, or corresponds to the font size. So for example, these, these two big ones, Burkholderia pseudomallei, I've, I've published 24 articles on Burkholderia and I've published 23 articles on Bacillus anthracis, which causes anthrax. Um, most so, so anthrax is is actually a really good model organism. It's been used for hundreds of years as a model organism, but there it doesn't really cause a lot of serious disease in humans. Humans don't don't typically get anthrax very very often, um, but some of these other pathogens are they're also bioterrorist agents. So there's usually funding associated with studying them, but they also cause serious disease. Um, some of them cause diseases that are most, most prevalent in Southeast Asia and Northern Australia, like um, Burkholderia pseudomallei, but some of them are also found all over the place in Europe and cause disease in Sweden. And so the fact that these cause serious disease has also been a big motivation for me to study them. Um, some of these pathogens are particularly associated with the lack of access to healthcare, which is something else that I'm interested in. So Vibrio cholera, for example, down here, um, was introduced into Haiti in 2010, and that followed an earthquake. And the initial outbreak of, of cholera killed about 10,000 people, and there are about a million cases. And so we published uh, um, a couple of papers documenting the origins of, of that outbreak and the, and the spread of that outbreak. Um, so if you contrast that outbreak of cholera in Haiti to say one of the most famous outbreaks in history, that occurred in London about 270 years ago in, in the 1850s. That outbreak in London killed 600 people. Okay, so we've got an outbreak in London 250, 270 years ago, killing 600 people. Vibrio cholera is, is very easily um, treated. And so it's an absolute travesty that in 2010, there was an outbreak in Haiti that caused that that killed 10,000 people. So sometimes we think that we're making progress and and other times it's it's clear that we don't we aren't making progress. Um so now my focus of my research is on Leptospira species and these are species of uh, a pathogen species that causes leptospirosis and leptospirosis is the world's most common 
and widespread zoonotic disease, but it mostly impacts poor tropical regions of the world. And so we don't hear about it too much in, in this country. Although those of you that have dogs probably got your dogs vaccinated for leptospirosis. Um, and if you didn't realize it, um, it probably happened still. So um, my focus is also on Staphylococcus aureus and, um, and it's about Staph aureus that I'm going to be talking to you today. And that's the subject of my, my Shirk funded research in Yuma. So the name Staphylococcus comes from the Greek word that means grape cluster or berry and aureus is Latin for golden. So under the microscope, these indeed appear to be um, like golden grapes, um, hence the title of my talk. So staph, um, as I usually refer to for short, so staph um, is usually um, colonizes people asymptomatically. So it just exists on in our upper respiratory tracts, in our nose, in our mouth, um, and it it often is not associated with disease. It's on our skin, sometimes even in our gut, but it's not causing disease. But occasionally it turns into from a commensal to a pathogen. And when it's a, when it's a pathogen, it causes infection. And this occurs when it's able to penetrate the outer layers of skin or mucosa and actually cause disease. So a lot of skin and soft tissue infections are caused by Staph aureus. And of course, in a presentation of infectious diseases, I've got to show you the oblig some obligatory um, gross pictures just so you guys know, can know what um, Staph aureus does. So it can cause um, diseases such as impetigo, which would be like a rash around a mouth, particularly common in, in young children. It can cause boils, such as this um, picture in the lower right-hand corner. It can cause styes, sort of infections of, of the, the eyelashes and causing your, your eyelids to swell a little bit. But it can also be a little bit more invasive. So get down and, um, and infect some of the lower, um, more deeper tissues. Um, such as this picture in the upper right-hand corner of cellulitis. It can also cause scalded skin syndrome, which is common, well, which is most often seen in babies. So those are skin and soft tissue infections, but Staph aureus can also get into your lungs and cause pneumonia. Um, it can get into your heart and cause endocarditis. It can get into your bones and cause osteomyelitis. It can even be in your gut and cause food poisoning. And it's also associated with toxic shock syndrome. And if it gets into your bloodstream, it causes bacteremia and, and sepsis, in which case you better get treated really quickly. So um, staph aureus is the most common cause of skin and soft tissue infections. And so this causes a really high, places a really high burden on patients and our healthcare systems. So I'm, I'm kind of curious to, to know in the audience how many people have had a skin and soft tissue infection that may or may not have been caused by staph aureus or any other pathogen. If you can like raise your hand or um, one, two, a handful of people. Good. Um, or maybe not good. Uh, so this is actually my dad. And, um, and this was, this picture was taken about two weeks ago. And it turns out that um, he was rushed to the, um, he lived in Northeastern New Mexico and he was rushed to the um, to the emergency room in Las Vegas and and he was um, unconscious and had this infection and so he was airlifted to Albuquerque and 
I got a call from my brother saying that he thought that my dad had a massive stroke and is unconscious. And, and before he was, he went unconscious, he could just mumble a few words. And um, anyway, so the next day he he was a little bit, um, he, he was still alive. Um, and, and he's still alive to this day and he's, he's recovering um, nicely, but he had that same type of of infection. So this is a cellulitis infection in his, in his lower leg. So just like um, that more mild picture that I had in, in this previous slide. Anyway, so I can tell you more about my dad at a, at a different time or during the, the question and answer session. Um, but yeah, so these types of in, infectious diseases, they impact all of us and, and we never know when, when they're going to hit. So um, anyway, I'll move on. So, um, so Staph aureus was typically thought of as a hospital acquired disease because there's a lot of people in hospitals with it um, that are immunocompromised. There's widespread use of antibiotics. And so it was a real problem in, in a hospital setting or a healthcare setting. But more recently, it has become more of a problem in a in a community setting. So we have realized that there's a lot of transmission among healthy people in the community. So, and, and then most troubling, the, the rates of healthcare or uh, hospital associated diseases have decreased, but now they remain steady and they're still too high. But the, the rates for community associated um, staph infections are actually climbing. So this is a problem, right? Health um, hospital associated rates are no longer declining and community associated rates are climbing. So clearly we're missing something in our understanding of the spread and the transmission of staph aureus. And so this is the crux of, of my research on staph. So if only we could understand where staff hangs out. Um, so what are the reservoirs for staff? And if we can understand what types of interactions between people lead to transmission, then we would have a much better um, way of, of um, controlling the spread of staph aureus. So what do we know about staph aureus? We know that it can be transmitted between people, but we don't really understand the mechanism. Is it because somebody shakes somebody else's hand or because somebody coughs or sneezes on somebody or just talks to somebody? Um, what sort of level of, of interactions is needed to cause transmission? We also know that, um, or we think that, that staff can be transmitted indirectly. So maybe for, by touching a contaminated surface, but, but also staff, some staff on some surfaces will last for a couple of days, um, but on other surfaces, it will die pretty quickly. We also know that people tend to infect, we, we tend to infect ourselves, right? We're colonized in our noses and our throats and other places on our, our body. And so if we then somehow get the pathogen from that reservoir into a cut, then we can then we are infecting ourselves. Um, previous research suggested that about 30% 30 30 of us are, are colonized with Staph aureus, but these numbers are based well, they're about 15 years old and mostly based on, on culture to detect um, staph aureus. So um, knowing where it is um, in the community is critical. And so we wanted to know what the carriage rates were. We wanted to know the carriage rates for different body sites, whether there was a difference in carriage rate um, with based on ethnicity, based on age, based on sex. We also thought there might be um, a link between carriage and socioeconomic status, like a lot of chronic diseases. Um, we're also 
interested in looking at the types of social relationships that are associated with colonization and with transmission, and knowing whether or not clinical strains are representative of what is circulating in the community, and also whether or not there's a disparity in infections as well as a disparity in carriage. And so we did this research in Yuma, Arizona, and some of the nearby towns like Somerton and San Luis. Yuma is a really interesting town, and the population pretty much doubles during the winter. I don't think you want to go there in the summer because it's really, really hot. And so the growing season for vegetables, which is the main industry there, is during the winter and spring. Um, and during that time, there's an influx of migrant labor, mostly Hispanic, mostly um, relatively young. Um, but also in the winter, there's an influx of um, retirees coming from Canada, coming from Iowa, any place where where they have to shovel snow, it seems. So there's all these old um, non-Hispanic white people that come in and, and hang out in the bingo halls and play pickleball. So here's a, um, a breakdown of the demographics in Yuma. And you can see that, um, you know, Hispanics make up about 100 sorry, 67% of the population and non-Hispanics make up about 33% of the population. But check out the, um, the, the age classes, age class distribution for the non-Hispanic whites. So you can see that around, you know, 55 to 65, there, there's, there's a peak there. And that's because of all these retirees coming and hanging out down there. So really interesting demographics. And um, what we did was, oops, um, we went to public spaces like the mall and we recruited groups of people that were obviously um, somehow socially related to each other. So they were hanging out together. We recruited them. We took some biological samples from them, a nose swab, a throat swab, and a hand swab. And here are some pictures of, of our staff administering these swabs to a social group. We would give them a survey to determine their demographics, but also to ask them questions about how they were connected to each other and also what sort of social connections they had beyond that, that group. And so the first thing that we had to do was um, was detect staph aureus. And we detected staph aureus by culture and by PCR. Now, um, you guys are probably all familiar with, with PCR because we just went through this global pandemic with um, COVID-19 and where it was emphasized the importance of, of PCR and the sensitivity of an accuracy of PCR in, in detecting the pathogen. And the same is true for, um, for Staph aureus. So, um, but we were really surprised that there wasn't actually a PCR assay developed for detecting Staph aureus that wasn't a commercialized product. And we didn't, we wanted to stay away from these commercial products because there was no way that we could easily verify them. A lot of them were made um, many years ago, and and so and the the DNA signatures that they use were proprietary, and so we couldn't just plug those in and search the the um, databases to see how sensitive or specific they were. So we developed our own, and um, and we also made it very amenable to allowing us to quantify how much staff was in a was was in a sample and that was something that was was novel and people hadn't really done before for staph aureus and so here are some of of our results this is kind of a big um chart with a lot of pie charts so i'll i'll walk you through it um in this first column are 
the results for when we just used culture to detect the presence or absence of staph aureus. In the second column were the results for when we used the PCR that we called essay quant to detect staph aureus. And then in this last um, column is the results when we combined both the culture detection and the PCR for detection. And then in, in this first row are um, the results for the NARES samples, the second um, row for the throat samples, this third row for the palm samples, and then lastly, this last row for each individual altogether. And so you can see that if you look at the last two, can you guys all see my, my cursor? Yeah, okay. Um, so if you look at these last two pie charts for the overall detection for nares and throat, you can see that about 42 point something um, percent of people are positive um, for their throat and nose. But in the palm, only about 27.6% of the people were positive. And so it looks like the prevalence is, is pretty similar for the throat and, and nares, but greater than what you would exp what you would find in the palm. And then for the participants, we found that 65.9%, so almost 70, or sorry, 66% of people were positive for staph aureus. So now think back to what I told you a few minutes ago about what we thought we knew about staph aureus, we thought that there was a prevalence of about 30% of us having staph aureus. So this really throws that um, into question. And it's clear that staph aureus is a lot more um, prevalent than we previously thought. And so here are some results with the quantities of staph aureus. Remember this assay is able to tell us how much as as well as just presence or absence. So these are this tells us a little bit about the quantities that we find across different sites. And of course, this has really important implications for the spread and the transmission and the and how people can infect themselves. So if somebody might if somebody's colonized with staph aureus, but there's only a tiny little bit, they're not shedding a ton of it, they're probably not going to, to be transmitting it and spreading it in the same way that somebody who's just got a ton of it in their in their nose as well. So as you can see from, from this chart, um, the quantity of staph aureus in the nares is significantly greater than the quantity in the throat. So these are violin charts that show that the the distribution uh, and the quantity on the on the uh, y axis. And so the nares have more than the throat, and the throat has more than the palm. Um, and interestingly, the quantities in the nares are highly variable. So sometimes we get, and this is on a log scale too. So um, sometimes we get a ton. Uh, in in people's nares, and sometimes we don't get very much. Okay, so what about colonization and its association with sex? So previous studies had shown that there was a higher prevalence um, and quantity in males compared to females, and we see that here in our data as well. So these these uh, darker bars are for the males and the lighter bars for females. And you can see across every body site, um, the, the males have more than the females. And then um, if you look down at the very bottom about the quantity, again, these are violin plots that show the distribution of quantity for males versus females. And so for the nares, it looks like the males have a higher quantity than the females, but that difference isn't statistically significant. And um, we didn't see any um, sex-based differences in quantity at other body sites. Okay, so here are some results for colonization and ethnicity. So previous study had showed that when when other people looked at the difference between Hispanics and non-Hispanic whites, there was no clear ethnic-based difference in prevalence. But this is not what 
what we saw. Um, there weren't any previous studies on quantities. So we see that non-Hispanics had a higher prevalence at, at each at each body site, you can see that the non-Hispanics in the lighter gray compared to the Hispanics in the darker gray, the um, non-Hispanics have a higher prevalence at all of the sites and and overall compared to the compared to the um, Hispanics. And as far as quantities go, uh, oops, sorry, I went back. Um, and as far as quantities go, you can see that Hispanics um have a lower quantity than non-hispanics um but that was in the nares but that doesn't um we don't see that same pattern in the throat and the palm and lastly um looking at colonization and age we divided our data into three age classes so 0 to 19 20 to 49 and over 50 and previous studies had shown that there was a prevalence, a higher prevalence um, in children that declined with age. And we didn't really see that same pattern, but we were seeing that the that middle age group was slightly higher than uh, um, the younger age, which was slightly higher than, than the, um, the older age. We didn't see any age-based differences in quantity at any of any of the body sites. And so um, the, this, this aspect of the research really showed us that we, we were finding unprecedentedly high community prevalence, right? Um, our, our new method allowed us to assess the, the load of the pathogen and also which would give us a lot of novel insights into staff carriage. Um, but it also suggested that previous research and current clinical practices likely misclassify over half of colonized persons. So if you're misclassifying them, how are you going to understand how to mitigate um, this disease? So we this work really emphasized the need to rebuild fundamental knowledge of of carriage with more accurate proposals. So this, this work was just recently published in the Journal of Infectious Diseases and the editor really liked it. And so the editor um, commissioned somebody to, to write an editorial about this work. So we were really excited about that. So, um, We know that that staff seems to be everywhere. There seems to be a, a, a disparity, an ethnic-based disparity and a sex-based disparity. And so we're left scratching our head as to why this is the case. So we thought, well, let's look and see whether or not there's an association with educational attainment. So um, with a lot of... of um, diseases, there's a strong association between socioeconomic status and mor morbidity and mortality in general. And so these are known as fundamental causes of health. Um, and they, like I said, it, it impacts most chronic diseases, but we didn't know whether it would impact um, infectious diseases like Staph aureus, and especially just the colonization of with Staph aureus. And so we actually did not find any association between um, so two socioeconomic status variables, which were home ownership and educational attainment and staph aureus colonization. So it appears that staph aureus colonization is outside the influence of socioeconomic status. Um, so those types of, of resources so that are associated with socioeconomic status can typically be mobilized to help avoid or mitigate preventable health risks. But it doesn't seem like that's going to be the case with, with Staph aureus. And so this work also suggests a little bit of a boundary for this fundamental cause theory. And so we're still scratching our heads trying to think of why there is this 
this disparity in colonization. And so another thing that we looked at was colonization and social network resources. Now, so social network resources are just the, the breadth and the variety and the types of, of interactions that you have with other people. And, and previous research had suggested that diversity of social network can actually be protective for symptomatic inf infections of the common cold. But on the other hand, um, it, contact with a lot of other people provides opportunity for an exposure and infection. So we're interested in, in exploring this a little bit further, but we found that there were um, neither the amount nor the diversity of social contacts were associated with Staph aureus colonization. And also, so this means that social network resources, they have neither a salutary or a detrimental impact on the risk of Staph aureus colonization. So again, we're scratching our heads and, and we think that maybe cohabitation or sort of those more intimate contacts would better explain Staph aureus transmission and colonization and prevalence. And, and we're working on that currently. And so one of the last questions that, that we had was whether or not these ethnic-based disparities that we, that we see in colonization also extend to infections. And so we worked with the folks at the Yuma, Yuma Regional Medical Center, and we um, got um, 32,500 hospital records from uh, 2015 through the middle of 2020, so over five and a half years worth of hospital records, and we screened them for um, records that had a lab culture test that were positive for Staph aureus. And we found 2,000 records that were positive for Staph aureus. And here's the, the, the data associated with them. Because of the different, the weird demographics in Yuma, we had to adjust the, um, the, the crude rates to figure out what the adjusted rate was. And, and so you can see that um, the blue bars are the non-Hispanic whites, the darker ones are the males, the lighter bars are, are the females. And you can see that in every single age class, except for this very, very last age class of over 84, um, the non-Hispanic white um, males and females had um, higher, a higher adjusted rates of infection compared to Hispanics. So, um, so that's very consistent with the data that we're seeing on colonization as well, where non-Hispanic whites were much more likely to be colonized than Hispanics. So another interesting thing from these data here are that there wasn't really any difference between the non-Hispanic white males and females in terms of their um, infection prevalence. But this sex-based disparity was, in fact, found among Hispanics, with Hispanic males um, having a higher rate of infection than Hispanic females, consistent to what we saw with, um, with the colonization data. So um, in summary of, of, of all of that, we developed a new and more sensitive detection method. We found that Staph aureus, these golden grapes, are everywhere, much more prevalent than, than we had seen before. Um, our data suggests that the Nares might be the main reservoir, but there's still a lot more work to do to determine whether the Nares are the main reservoir for, for infecting other people and for infecting other body sites. We can see that non-Hispanic whites have a higher prevalence in um, and, and quantity. And we can see that um, socioeconomic status does not appear to be associated with colonization and social network resources also does not appear to be associated with colonization. And interestingly, this the colonization disparities that we see based on ethnicity and sex 
are also found in infection and, and the clinical cases. So we've come a long way, but we still have a lot to do in understanding where staff is hiding and how these golden grapes are transmitted and how they're associated with infection. And obviously our end goal is to help and prevent transmission and the spread of disease. So with that, I would like to acknowledge um, all of, there were many, many people, a very large team that, that helped out with this project. Um, there were a number of other investigators at NAU, particularly Stephen Barger and Bob Trotter and uh, uh, Monica Leininger. And uh, most significantly were our collaborators down in Yuma with Yuma Regional Medical Center, led by Trudy Milner, and the Regional Center for, Bio for Border Health, um, led by Amanda Aguirre, and the um, some professors at NAU Yuma who helped coordinate the, the collection of the samples, as well as Marisol Penuelas, who also was from the um, Regional Center for Border Health that that helped collect these samples. Um, over the course of this work, I've had a number of lab supervisors working with me, and these people have been very important, and a lot of student researchers um, that have that have really been important in in processing the samples in the lab, collecting the samples in the field, um, and helping me write up some of this work. And of course. Um, a big shout out to Shirk because this was one of the the main funded projects with the, in the first go around of of uh, Shirk with a lot of NIH funding and I also got some NIH funding myself as a, as an R15. So thank you very much and I can take questions. Wonderful. Thank you very much for your presentation. Um, I do realize that we have about five minutes left. And while you are thinking about your question, I am going to share um, a slide up on the screen. We would love to get your feedback on what you thought about today's presentation. Um, and we will also have the link to our evaluation survey in the chat box. So. I'll leave that up and um, fire away with your questions, comments, feedback. I want to hear about some infections. <laughs> um, I have a question. So I grew up in Yuma, so it was interesting to see this. Um, but do you know if like the non-Hispanic um white samples that you got are like permanent residents or would you consider them like they call them like snowbirds? Um I don't know. I think that a lot of them were actually permanent residents. Um yeah. So we're we're doing a similar study in Flagstaff right now, and we've collected a lot of samples from FUST school kids. And so we'll be able to start to see whether or not we see these same sort of ethnic-based disparities. And also in Flagstaff, we're, we've got a lot of samples from Native American kids as well. Uh, um, so that'll be really interesting to compare as well. But yeah, yeah uh, Yuma is fascinated and and I was really surprised that if um, you know when you break down the the uh, prevalence for different ethnicities, if you're a Hispanic female, um, then you have just a much, much lower um, prevalence rate than if you're a non-Hispanic white male. Thank you. Mm-hmm. I think we have time for uh, one more question or comment before we wrap up. I have a, a question. So, hi, Tal. Um, um, I'm curious about like what, like what is what what you do with kind of those findings. I know from like the 
kind of lab side, like you have your assay that you're developing and everything, but do you have any, like, like what else do you do to like kind of help prevent those? Like do any like education or like, like how do you translate that into something for the community that they can um, use or like help, like be supportive of the community health? Yeah, that's a really good question. And of course that's that's the, the ultimate goal. Um, but to but to know how best to prevent the disease, we need to know where it is, who's carrying it, and how it's transmitted. Remember when when COVID nineteen hit, the first thing like we were all freaking out and and wiping down our grocery bags. Remember, and then people thought people kind of figured out how it was being transmitted and then realized, oh, well, we don't need to wipe down every door handle and grocery bag because it's it's mostly coming from aerosols from from when we talk. And so we need to know if if that's the case, we'll handle it very differently. If it's in the nose, we'll we'll handle it very differently than if it's in the mouth. With COVID nineteen, it was in both, and and you know when you talk, you 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 have a lot more aerosolized um, particles than if you're just breathing through through your nose, and so you know we need to we need to figure out how it's how it's transmitted. Is it indeed transmitted via um, contaminated objects like door handles, or is it only from 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 talking to people we just don't know and so we can't we can't go to that next step until we know and and you know some of this research has has really surprised me because um i didn't know that it was nearly as prevalent as it is and there's been a there's been you know 50 plus years of research on this and now our research is showing that you know, maybe we need to take that research with a grain of salt because it wasn't very, very sensitive and it was probably missing and not detecting a lot of cases of, of colonization. So we really need to start from from the ground up before we can answer that question. Thank you. Yeah. Great question. So I do I do want to respect um, your time here. I'm going to leave this slide up. Um, if you want to connect with Tal, shoot him an email. His email address is there. Or you want to learn more about the work at the Pathogen and Microbiome Institute or PMI, uh, you may visit their website. And I'll go ahead and leave the room open if uh, a few of you want to linger and, and have uh, ask additional questions or dialogue for another five minutes. But I do realize that Patricia had her hand up, so I do want to call on her. But thank, thank you again for attending. Thank you so much. This has been a great um, uh, tele whatever Zoom meeting. <laughs> what would you recommend for prevention strategies? Like, you know, should you? I heard recently that we should be uh, gargling like three times a day, or should we be blowing our nose just every day? Quite a couple times a day. I don't know what. What do you recommend? Well, I, I think that we need a lot more research to figure out how colonization is related to, um, to infection, right? So the the link, you know, I I said that most people tend to infect themselves, and and there's a little bit of data on that, but I think that there could be a lot more. And it could be that different strains are um, more likely to result in infection than others. I mean, the fact that that um, if you're a non-Hispanic white male, like 80 some percent of us are walking around with with staff in in our nose and throat, yet we're not all dropping dead or or you know showing up at the the hospital with with infections. So I think there's something that's a little bit more complicated, and and so I would not recommend just going out and trying to get rid of whatever staff is 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 on your body because if we get rid of one thing then maybe something else will 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 come in um, and we don't know what the impact would be. Um, I think that what I would say is that 
you know, if you're going into surgery, for example, they typically will test you for staph aureus, but they, they test you with a, with a culture test, um, which isn't very sensitive. Um, and then they'll try to, they'll give you some drops in your nose to make sure that you're not shedding a lot while you're um, in surgery. But, you know, I, I think I would just be very careful uh, about monitoring my skin, for example, and, and being aware that infections are possible. And so, you know, you might not be able to get rid of the staff that's in your body or on your body, and maybe you don't need to. I, I just don't know, but but I think that you just have to be aware of what can happen next. Um, you know, I, I talked about about my dad, and it turns out that they they started treating him for as if his infection was a staph aureus infection. I don't think it was. And, and I actually took some samples from him and, and uh, we're running those in the lab. So, um, but in the hospital, they didn't actually figure out what um, was causing that infection, but there's other bacteria that, that can cause similar infections. So one is group A strep, which is what I think he has. And the reason I think that is because they were treating him with antibiotics that were specific to, to staph and they weren't working. Um, and so he actually got a little bit, a little bit worse. So um, I think that what you need to do is kind of um, be aware of cuts in your skin and whether or not you're likely to get a, an infection, just take care of those and prevent, prevent your, yourself from getting an infection um, rather than trying to treat yourself prophylactically with against something that you're not really sure what it will cause or what impact it will have. Thank you for that question. We have one more in the chat, which I had overlooked, mm -hmm. and it is from Priyanka, who I think just, just jumped off. Um, but we can end on this because I think it's a really great question. How has your experience living in so many global communities shaped your understanding of what constitutes equity in health science research? That's a good question. And it's 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 not something that I've really thought about. It was just part of part of, of my life. And I I think it it shaped just in general, my values. Um, and what I what I found was important, you know, I didn't want to go into business and just make a lot of money. And I, you know, I wanted to um, help other people help conservation efforts initially. Um, and so um, I think that, that I'm just, I, I kind of, look out for those types of projects that are involved with um, health equity and and uh, and and then some of these global health challenges that we see and I'm very drawn to them and and if I if I think that some of my experience and my expertise in in molecular biology um, and epidemiology will will help then I'll you know, I'll try to pursue those. Wonderful. Well, we have a comment from uh, Dr. Naomi Lee. Thank you for a great talk. And I think that uh, we will leave it here. Thank you all for attending. Uh, keep a lookout for our next Fairness First X talk, which will happen in the spring of 2024. But again, thank you very much for your time and sharing your knowledge and your experiences, Dr. Pearson. And I wish you all a great day. Thank you. Thank you.